Imagine trying to find a needle on the floor using low wattage overhead lighting. You might strain and stare and never see the object. But focus a bright beam torch on the needle and suddenly it comes into view. This program is about a relatively new source of light that just like this torch is making the study of tiny substances possible like never before. The synchrotron is essentially a massive light bulb um, that can be a million times brighter than the sun, specifically in x-rays, but uh, yeah, over the whole spectrum it is extremely bright. It's the brightest uh, light that we know how to make. So how is a synchrotron made? In this program, we'll not only investigate the basic design of a synchrotron, we'll also look at the properties of synchrotron radiation and the theoretical and applied physics behind its interaction with materials. But first, let's consider some useful applications of this unique device. The applications of a synchrotron can be put in two categories, analysis and manufacturing. Under analysis, many medical imaging techniques can be carried out. To start with, the X-rays emitted from a synchrotron are far superior to conventional X-rays and open up new possibilities for medical science. New drugs can be designed and developed. Studying DNA becomes clearer with synchrotron light and will allow scientists to move to the next stage in the Human Genome Project. We now know what the genes do, what they make, the question now is the genes make proteins, what do the proteins do? And the synchrotron is um, the tool that enables us to try and understand what proteins look like. There are direct applications for the mining industry. When a substance is dug from the ground, how do we know what we have? Synchrotron technology allows far better analysis than ever before. We get microanalysis. It's possible to actually determine what is in a one cubic micron of matter. Um, because the light is so bright, we can analyze it. So, of course, there are possibilities in forensic science. For instance, if there's a very tiny sample, what have you got? What's there? Other analysis, like understanding surface structures and catalysts, is easily done using a synchrotron. This has application in car engine design. And synchrotrons aren't just for analysis. There are new and yet to be discovered manufacturing techniques emerging now because of what synchrotrons can do. Lithography, the process of shining light onto light sensitive materials for etching, is used for building integrated circuits in computers and electronic devices. Synchrotron light can extend this process to three dimensions. The Japanese using this technology have made a uh, a little motor car that's only two millimetres long and it actually has an engine in it that goes along. So one of them, you have to say, why do you want to do that? Well, the, the dream um, that people talk about in medicine is having little robots that you inject into the body and instead of having a surgeon coming in with a big knife, the little robot goes in and, uh, and for instance, cleans out a blocked artery. Um, so. Yeah, there's, there, is, there are manufacturing aspects of the synchrotron as well as analytical aspects, which is what's dominating it at the moment. In summary, a synchrotron can be used firstly for analysis, common applications in the medical field, the human genome project, mining industry, forensic science, to name a few. Secondly, a synchrotron can be used for manufacturing, extending the idea of lithography to nanotechnology. A synchrotron has six main components. Electron gun, LINAC, booster ring, storage ring, beam lines, and the experimental stations. 
Producing synchrotron light starts at the electron gun. The electron gun emits electrons in a kind of boiling process. When a metal is heated, the electrons within are freed up enough to escape from its surface in a process known as thermionic emission. The synchrotron's electron gun is very similar to the electron gun found in a common TV set, except in a TV it's considerably smaller. Once the electrons are released, they are directed by the linear accelerator, or LINAC as it is known. The LINAC incorporates the electron gun at one end, the cathode end. As electrons are released, they are attracted to the positively charged anode, forming a stream about the width of a human hair. In the centre of the anode is a tiny hole that allows the stream to pass through beginning its long journey through the rest of the synchrotron. The voltage between the cathode and anode is extremely high, causing electrons to reach a velocity 99% of the speed of light. The LINAC feeds into the booster ring, which uses magnetic fields to force the electrons to travel in a circle. As an electron of charge E moves through a magnetic field of strength B, at velocity v, we can calculate the force using this equation. In this inner circle of the synchrotron, microwaves are used to add even more energy to the electrons, which ultimately produces the best light. It's in the storage ring, however, where synchrotron light is actually produced. At a diameter of approximately 60 meters, the storage ring is more of a multi-sided shape than a true circle. The electron stream travels in straight lines and at each bend is directed into the next corner. Around the storage ring is a series of magnets. These cause the beam to bend or to travel in a snaking path. And here's where the key effect takes place. Whenever the beam turns a sharp corner, light is produced. It's something like the drops of water that come off a spinning wet tennis ball. The alternating magnets create numerous corners that bend the electron stream, emitting radiation at every sharp turn. Designing a synchrotron involves getting the forces on the beam exactly right to produce radiation in a single direction. Magnets in the synchrotron are adjustable. As the magnetic field strength is increased, the forces on the electron stream increase, creating tighter bends along its path. This change in curve produces a change in the wavelength of the radiation emitted. A tight curve produces short wavelength radiation, while gentle curves produce longer wavelength radiation, like infrared. We'll look at wavelengths in detail a little later on. The beam lines house many optical devices which control the light for the end user, focusing, measuring and purifying the beam along its final path. As many as 20 individual workstations can be added to the synchrotron. It's at these workstations that synchrotron radiation hits matter placed in its path. This is where the experimental work takes place, but we'll look more at that later. The main components of a synchrotron and their function can be summarised as follows. The electron gun emits electrons by a process called thermionic emission. The LINAC, or linear accelerator, accelerates the electrons by applying a large voltage. In the booster ring, the electron stream is accelerated further by strong magnetic fields. The force on individual electrons can be calculated using the equation F equals EVB, where V is the velocity of an electron of charge E moving through magnetic field B. The storage ring is where synchrotron radiation is produced. At every bend in this multi-sided ring, radiation beams off the electron stream like water off a tennis ball. Varying the curve with magnets 
varies the frequency of radiation emitted. Beamlines channel and improve the quality of radiation produced. And the experimental stations are where synchrotron radiation is put to use as it strikes the desired sample. Radiation has always been important to our exploration of the world. We explore with our eyes using radiation we know as light. But light is just one small part of a whole spectrum of radiation. The electromagnetic spectrum describes all forms of radiation, shown here in order of wavelength. The longest wavelengths, radio waves, are used for observing the vast distances of space. The average wavelength of a radio wave is about the length of a large truck. Microwaves can be used for radar detection of ships, planes and cyclones and average the length of a volleyball. Infrared radiation is used for night vision systems and tracking missiles by detecting their heat sources and is roughly the length of living cells. In the narrow band of the spectrum known as light, we see variations in wavelength as colour. X-rays are the best source of radiation for researching crystal structures. And gamma rays, having the shortest wavelength, allow scientists to explore the inner world of atoms. Synchrotron radiation is a continuous band of the electromagnetic spectrum that includes infrared, visible light, ultraviolet and X-rays. It got its name in 1947 when it was accidentally discovered by scientists working on a device they called an electron synchrotron. Over time, scientists have improved the quality of synchrotron radiation enormously. Now the basic properties of light produced in a modern synchrotron are high brightness. Synchrotron radiation is extremely intense. In fact, it is hundreds of thousands of times more intense than conventional X-ray tubes. It is also highly collimated, meaning that the rays produced are very close to parallel at the edges. Wide energy spectrum. Synchrotron radiation is emitted with a wide range of energies, allowing a beam of any energy to be produced. Synchrotron radiation is highly polarized. Put simply, this means that the wave motion of the radiation oscillates in one direction only. And finally, it is emitted in very short pulses, typically less than a nanosecond or one billionth of a second. The properties of synchrotron radiation are similar in many ways to that of laser light. The most important difference, however, is that a laser is not variable. Each beam line in a synchrotron the researcher with a continuously variable source of light, sweeping through any desired wavelength. This variability opens up enormous scope for new research. There are dye lasers, and dye lasers you can get different colours. The problem is it tends to take you many minutes, if not hours, to change from one colour to another. Um, the synchrotron you can do it in seconds. The electromagnetic spectrum, from longest to shortest wavelength, includes radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, X-rays and gamma rays. Synchrotron radiation is that part of the spectrum from infrared to X-rays produced in a synchrotron. The machinery within a synchrotron refines this radiation so that it has these properties. High brightness, both in intensity and collimation, a wide energy spectrum, highly polarized, and emitted in short pulses. It differs to laser light in its greater variability. While the synchrotron can vary the frequency of radiation within a range, X-rays are the most useful type of synchrotron radiation because their wavelength matches the scale of molecules and crystals.
The way that synchrotron radiation interacts with matter is at the heart of all scientific work carried out in the synchrotron. X-rays are the type of radiation of most interest to scientists because their wavelength matches the scale of crystals and molecules, as we saw earlier. A synchrotron can adjust and measure X-rays in a number of ways. X-ray imaging with a synchrotron is like a high-tech way of using conventional X-rays. Studying bones, for example, can be extended to three-dimensional modelling. X-ray absorption spectroscopy is all about how X-rays are absorbed or released by the matter being studied. Some techniques look at how the material's own electrons are released, a process called the photoelectric effect. Other areas of study include ionization, fluorescence and OJ spectroscopy. But much of this is beyond the scope of an introductory look at the synchrotron. Of interest here, however, is X-ray scattering and how diffraction patterns are produced as a result. When X-ray photons collide with electrons in a substance, some photons will be deflected away from their initial direction of travel, in the same way that billiard balls bounce off each other. If the wavelength of the scattered ray did not change, meaning the X-ray photons did not lose any energy, the process is called elastic scattering, sometimes referred to as Thomson scattering. It was J.J. Thomson who proved the existence of the electron around the turn of the 20th century. Elastic scattering tells us a great deal about the substance when the reflected photons are measured. We'll look at how that works shortly. Inelastic scattering occurs when some of the photon's energy is lost to the electron. By studying the energy lost by X-ray light striking electrons, Arthur Compton confirmed the existence of photons, so this type of scattering bears his name. Inelastic scattering, however, occurs less often than elastic scattering. It's elastic scattering that produces clear diffraction patterns. So what are these patterns, and what do they show us? Let's take it a step at a time, starting with diffraction. Diffraction describes the interference that happens when waves bend around objects. One feature of all waves, whether it's light, x waves on the water, is that when they interfere with one another, they form a pattern of ridges and flat areas, as shown here. It's easy to see what's happening from the side superimpose two waves at places where the peaks or troughs line up. The wave energies add and a larger peak or trough is formed. At other places where the waves are out of phase by just the right amount, there is a flat spot. And so the interference pattern forms. We can see this effect with light when we use monochromatic or single wavelength light. Instead of two separate lamps, we use one and shine the light through two very narrow slits, which then act as two sources. This is what you see. A series of light and dark bands, or interference fringes. That describes light passing through two narrow slits. But it's a little different to light striking electrons in a substance. One leap that 20th century science had to make in understanding light, in fact all electromagnetic radiation, including X-rays, was this. Light photons, the smallest packets of light, behave both as a particle and as a wave. The accepted theory being that light is an atomic oscillator, emitting energy in small chunks called energy quanta. Light photons behave like a particle at times and like a wave at other times. Back to X-ray diffraction. When the stream of X-ray photons hit an electron and elastic scattering takes place, X-rays bounce off according to the basic laws of reflection. That is, angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. But of course, photons strike more than one electron. 
When two photons strike the two layers of electrons in a material at angle theta, something interesting happens. They both bounce off at the same angle, but they leave the substance at different times. Because the photons also behave like waves, the two photon streams are now out of phase and will interfere with each other. The degree to which they are no longer aligned is affected by the distance d, the angle theta, and the wavelength lambda. It was Lawrence Bragg who spotted this relationship and showed that it was possible mathematically to work out where the additive effect of interference would occur. These are the light spots we call maxima. The formula he devised was this, 2d sine theta equals n lambda, where d is the distance between two planes of atoms, theta is the angle of incidence, and lambda is the wavelength of the light. n is any whole number which allows for the ongoing pattern we see as repeating bands. But substances are more than just two neat rows of atoms. Before we study the resulting patterns, let's recap on this background theory. The synchrotron can vary and measure X-rays in many ways as they hit matter in the workstations. However, only X-ray scattering was introduced here at this level. Elastic or Thomson scattering is what happens when a photon loses no energy after hitting an electron. Inelastic or Compton scattering is when energy is lost by a photon hitting an electron. Diffraction describes the interference that happens when waves bend around objects. The theory of light states that light photons both scatter like particles and interfere or diffract like waves. This interesting behaviour can be mathematically described by Bragg's law, which is 2d sine theta equals n lambda, where d is the distance between two planes of atoms, theta is the angle of incidence, lambda is the wavelength of the light, and n is any whole number. Exploring the world of atoms and molecules is a bit like a giant guessing game. Imagine you created a 3D molecule that looked like this, but the only way you could describe it to your friend was with a two-dimensional drawing. From the top, your drawing might look like this. If your friend tried to rebuild the shape from your drawing, it may leave a bit to be desired, but it could be done. In a synchrotron, diffraction patterns can be recorded on photographic film and provides the scientist with information a bit like the drawing for your friend. In the previous section, we saw how X-ray photons bounce off electrons at predictable angles. When an extra row was added, the X-ray photons interfered with each other, creating patterns of light and dark areas. When a third dimension is added, the result is a pattern of dots, a diffraction pattern. Using complex mathematics, scientists have devised ways of interpreting the intensity and location of dots in a diffraction pattern so that the original shape can be worked out. In 1953, James Watson and Francis Crick used these methods on the patterns produced by Franklin and Wilkins to calculate the double helix shape of the DNA molecule we've come to know so well. One of the best ways to help your friend guess the right shape is to come up with a clearer drawing. So how do you get better drawings? Scientists produce better diffraction patterns by a process called crystallization. Crystals are repetitious arrangements of atoms and molecules, and when there are more repetitions of the same structure, the interference or diffraction pattern becomes more clearly defined. Perfect crystals of infinite size produce 
perfect diffraction patterns that can be reinterpreted perfectly by maths. But of course no crystal is perfect, which leads us to the final type of scattering we'll cover in this program, diffuse scattering. Diffuse scattering occurs often with materials that are very imperfectly crystallized. Liquids, polymers and biological materials are common examples of these. However, within these substances are areas that are in fact highly ordered. A technique known as small angle scattering allows these patterns to be recorded by placing the detector a large distance away from the sample. Small angle scattering has been used to study the crystallization of chocolate during different stages of its production. The cocoa fat molecules crystallize in different ways depending on a number of factors which ultimately affect taste. Wide angle scattering is the opposite technique which finds broad areas of regularity in otherwise unordered materials. By applying these and a range of other techniques Synchrotrons have found applications in many industrial, biological and emerging scientific research fields. So, in summary, X-ray photons scatter at predictable angles. In two dimensions, the scattered rays produce light and dark bands. In three dimensions, a pattern of dots, called a diffraction pattern, is produced. A synchrotron records these patterns. Like a limited drawing of a complicated object, these patterns give scientists clues about the sample being studied. Crystallizing a sample improves the clarity of the pattern. Diffuse scattering occurs with substances that aren't perfectly crystallized and can be studied in two ways, small angle scattering and wide angle scattering. We started this program by looking at some common applications of the synchrotron for analysis and manufacturing. We saw the basic design of a synchrotron, looking at its six basic components, the properties of synchrotron radiation and where it fitted on the electromagnetic spectrum. And finally, we looked at what happens when synchrotron radiation interacts with materials both the theoretical background of light and the results seen and studied by scientists in the experimental stations. This remarkable machine will continue to have a huge impact on science and technology in the 21st century.